a recording of the seminar of the Alberta branch of the Federal Social Credit Rally held on March 8, 1971. The speaker, Mr. Wallace Klink. Ladies and gentlemen, first I'd like to say I'm very grateful to talk to you tonight about something that I feel is very important. I'm going to say some rather unconventional things tonight, and in view of that, I was going to give you a definition of the words leisure and work, which will come up quite frequently. However, the speaker that is to follow me is apparently going to deal with this subject, so I will just let you think about it as I go along. Social creditors are convinced that the world is now witnessing a rapid disintegration of civilization. They also believe that implementation of social credit policies would quickly reverse this trend and open the gates to a new renaissance for mankind. Those who have become deeply involved in social credit activities have come to realize, however, that two major obstacles have inhibited widespread acceptance of the social credit features. Social credit is admittedly a difficult subject to master. So that we see one of these difficulties or obstacles is obviously on the intellectual plane. But it is not, I believe, on the intellectual level that the greatest barrier to the realization of social credit philosophy and policy lies. The purpose of my address this evening is to shed some light on these two problem areas, especially the latter, that is the psychological. I have chosen the topic social credit, unemployment, and leisure because it is in these areas that a decisive breakthrough in understanding must come if the doctrine of social credit is to be finally released to have its full impact on society. The late Clifford Hugh Douglas, Scottish engineer and founder of the social credit movement, once asked the question, what are we, social creditors, aiming at? In answer to his own question, he said, we are endeavoring to bring to birth a new civilization. We are doing something which really extends far be beyond the confines of a change in the financial system. We are hoping by various means, chiefly financial, to enable the human community to definitely step out of one type of civilization into another type of civilization. And the first and basic requirement, as we see it, of that is absolute economic security. Now, Major Douglas's statement suggests that social credit is a far-reaching and novel exposition designed to bring profound changes in society. Indeed it is, being diametrically opposed to the central economic premises and ethical or moral position which constitute the foundation of the present world system as it exists from the United States of America to the Soviet Union. Douglas stressed repeatedly that the world is today engaged in a gigantic struggle between two opposing philosophical systems. One system in the ascendant at the present time works towards centralization of power and subjection of the individual through economic and political means to the group, or in reality to the elite core which controls the group. Social credit stands as the suppressed alternative or opposite policy and aims toward emancipation of the individual from the group through decentralization of economic and political power. Whereas the policy of the existing world system is to control men through denial of their rightful inheritance, social credit would grant men the increasing right to choose or refuse one thing at a time by restoring to them the inheritance that they have lost, one might say literally, for a mess of pottage. Now, Douglas believed that the fate of civilization depended upon the outcome of this great philosophical conflict. He warned repeatedly that if civilization is to be saved, men must understand that all policies can be traced back to their respective philosophies. Only by learning to effectively identify the philosophical pedigree of the many ostensibly disparate policies impinging upon them can men devise effective strategies to reverse the present disastrous trends which afflict society. The social creditors are eventually to succeed in saving civilization from the eclipse of the new dark age. They must clearly understand that the major world problem manifests itself in a need to choose resolutely 
between two opposite, conflicting, and incompatible policies, that of full employment and leisure. Let us be entirely clear about one thing. Social credit proclaims the leisure society. It is implacably and relentlessly at war with all measures designed by policy to create full employment. Social creditors realize that in a world so thoroughly brainwashed by a perverse and nearly all-pervading puritanism into accepting economic activity as the chief purpose of man and economic slavery as a normal condition, opposition to the universally accepted policy of full employment is so unique and startling an approach as to immediately arouse all manner of objections and doubts. Only through perseverance and a genuine open will to learn can the individual mind overcome and dissipate such objections and doubts. Although partly intellectual, the problem is primarily a psychological, moral, or spiritual one. And until men are able to conquer it, there can be little hope for a better world. As Douglas so aptly put it, society has been hypnotized, and only a drastic dehypnotization can save it. This is taken from an essay written in the Social Creditors, December the 15th, 1945, entitled Under Which Came. Now, Major Douglas's works provide the means of dehypnotization for those who will hear. In his Swanwick address, delivered in November of 1924, he provided the essential insights. Quote, the policy of the world economic system amounts to a philosophy of life. There are really only three alternative policies in respect to a world economic organization. The first is that it is an end in itself for which man exists. The second is that while not an end in itself, it is the most powerful means of constraining the individual to do the things he does not wish to do. That is, it is a system of government and implies the fixed idea of what the world ought to be. And the third is that economic activity is simply a functional activity of men and women in the world and that the end of man, while unknown, is something towards uh, which most rapid progress is made by the free expansion of individuality, and that therefore economic organization is most efficient when it most easily and rapidly supplies economic wants without encroaching on other activities. And of course, in his first book, Economic Democracy, published first in 1920, Douglas had already specified the task of social credit. It is suggested, he wrote, that the primary requisite is to obtain, in the readjustment of the economic and political structure, such control of initiative that by its exercise, every individual can avail himself of the benefits of science and mechanism, that by their aid he is placed in such a position of advantage that in common with his fellows, he can choose, with increasing freedom and complete independence, whether he will or not assist in any project that may be put before him. Thus was the foundation upon which Major Douglas erected his policies in the realm of political and social economy. During the First World War, Douglas had discovered in the price system a major flaw, which he demonstrated would increase with the advance of technology. He warned that this flaw would it gradually erode the stability of society by creating intensified internal pressures upon the economic and social system. Indeed, if left unrecognized and allowed to continue, it would be the time bomb that would eventually destroy civilization. By creating anarchical conditions, it would submerge men into a new dark age by compelling them to accept as their only salvation the imposition of a world tyranny. Now, Douglas outlined with precision the necessary steps to avert this disaster. His counsel was ignored. And so we find ourselves, after a series of booms and depressions, and a second and de facto continuing world war. We've had a world war most of this century. In the, just different phases of it, that's all. In the present rapidly deteriorating situation, Centralization of power is continually at pace. The individual is becoming more and more the victim of economic, political, and social forces that he cannot understand, and which threaten his sense of 
security in a world that seems paradoxically to be actually and potentially better off in the material sense than at any other time in history. The prospects for a new age made possible by compounding scientific and educational advances seem in many ways to have eluded mankind. That civilization has gone off course seems undebatable. It remains, however, to discover the cause of the tragedy. The answer is, of course, that we have been taking advice from the wrong experts, from men who formulate unrealistic policies because they adhere to false philosophy. A recent article in Time magazine, December 14, 1970, entitled The Battle of the Buck, Inflation's Stubborn Resistance, pinpoints the modern dilemma. Referring to the United States economy, the article begins with the question, quote, Faced with runaway inflation, the government adopts policies that cause a year and a half of falling production, dropping profits, financial squeeze, and sharply rising unemployment. What is the result? The article provides the answer. More inflation. The writers are perplexed, or seem to be perplexed, because this result flies in the face of orthodox economic theory. The article goes on to discuss the dangerous revolutionary potential of continuing inflation of money because it erodes the credibility of the social and economic structure. Puzzled over the demonstrated historical inability to contain inflation, the galaxy of eminent economists whose views are given are finally compelled to admit that inflation seems always to have been intensified by attempts to maintain full employment. Now this observation must be painful indeed to so-called experts who have periodically chastised the people for an alleged extravagance and at the same time recommended measures which could only reduce national productivity. Yet, what do all of these experts and economists conclude is the task of modern government? As one might expect, they all concur, in spite of all evidence to the contrary, that it is to ma maintain stable prices with full employment. This brings us back to C.H. Douglas and his analysis of the existing price system. Before discussing this, however, several comments are necessary regarding orthodox financial practice and cost accountancy. Past and present practice have been to issue money in the form of debt credit expansion, which uh, with attached interest charges or from capital reserves, all ultimately and theoretically for production purposes only. You should remember that. Now, money is issued for production purposes only, ultimately. What Douglas discovered was like a revelation in a mental blackout concerning matters economic. He found that over any given period, for all industries and for the economy as a whole, financial costs are being generated much more rapidly than purchasing power by which to liquidate these costs. That is, society does not have a dynamic capacity at any moment to claim its own product and at the same time liquidate or cancel the formal financial cost incurred by that production. Yet, the physical costs of production are met as production proceeds. They have to be, or production could not take place. In other words, the financial system does not reflect reality. Financial cost exceeds real cost. The causes of this distressing phenomenon are laid bare in Douglas's formal statement describing the state of affairs, which statement is known as the A plus B theorem. It is not the intent of this lecture to expand in detail concerning the A plus B theorem. Essentially, however, the causes of excessive cost creation, which it reveals, involve the conventional bank practice of creating new debt credit. You must remember that banks never loan their customers' deposits, as many people still imagine. In other words, the conventional practice of creating new debt credit as production loans and requiring more than they create in the first instance to be repaid because of added interest charges. They also involve, and this is of particular significance, the reinvestment of savings, which creates new costs without creating new purchasing power. Now, this is an interesting point because the orthodox economists say that investment distributes new incomes. Social credit, in fact, 
claims that it creates new power. The only way that the economy can be kept operating in the face of this disproportionate buildup of costs is by the creation of ever larger loans, all at interest, for expanding capital production and production of goods for export. This tends to allow the transfer of at least a portion of the goods waiting to be bought. However, these loans must be repaid. They are not genuine purchasing power, but rather a pyramiding charge or mortgage against future earnings of purchasing power. They merely transfer accumulating costs into future prices in an endless spiral of inflation. This would be cost push inflation. Now, this problem of disproportionate financial cost creation through so-called normal operation of the price system can be viewed in different ways. Now, one might say that capital production loans dilute the value of the currency when they're issued, because it's an expansion of money. And when these loans are canceled by repayment, before the capital assets wear out, depreciation charges on these assets are carried forward into future prices with no credit existing to meet and cancel these charges. Now, one may say that the present price system charges the consumer for total production of a given period, while it should charge the consumer only with total consumption over that same period. That is, the present price system cannot credit the consumer through falling prices for capital appreciation. It can only charge him with capital depreciation. Now, this situation is complicated and worsened by the advance of technology, as non-labor costs in industry become greater relative to labor costs, as they do in a modernizing economy, the flow of total costs swells in relation to the flow of labor costs paid out as incomes, and the deficiency of purchasing power becomes increasingly aggravated. Periodic attempts to combat inflation by restricting the issue or expansion of bank debt credit loans through imposition of a tight money policy are progressively less effective in coping with the built-in tendency in the price system toward excessive cost accumulation. Any temporary restraint on rising prices that may be achieved by this restriction of credit can only be at great social and economic cost. When the credit tap is turned off, unliquidated costs are caught hanging in mid-air. Production, profits, earned incomes, and therefore overall economic solvency are forcibly driven down. Bankruptcies abound. Capital values, as you see on the stock market, are driven down, often violently. And if not violently, certainly excessively. And the centralization of power and wealth proceeds as the smaller production units are taken over more and more by the larger monopolistic organizations. From the foregoing discussion, we can begin to understand the <coughs> failure of the orthodox financial experts to deal effectively with inflation over the years. It's interesting to note the history in Great Britain. The pound before the First World War was worth uh, 20 shillings. Now, three shillings in the pound. What then is the solution to this persistent and deepening problem? C.H. Douglas takes us back to economic reality in a remarkable adaptation of the medieval church's concept of the just credium, or just price. To the conditions of modern technological production, he asserts as an axiom that the true cost of production is consumption. In any given period, the true cost of production is the amount of consumption that takes place. Technological efficiency has resulted in an ever-growing net gain of production over consumption. Otherwise, we would never realize an accumulation of physical wealth and would always be engaged in a bare hand-to-mouth existence. Consequently, the true cost of production is in fact falling, and the consumer should reap a commensurate benefit to increased purchasing power and falling prices, backed, of course, by this real wealth. It is at this point that the social credit makes a resolute and decisive departure from orthodoxy. Money is essentially a bookkeeping system. If, as we have seen, new wealth is created without the introduction of new credits to properly reflect its existence, then it is obvious that such new credits must be provided by some appropriate means. 
And if costs are being created more rapidly than incomes, then credits must be provided that will cancel these excess costs without creating new financial costs in the process. That is, we must depart from convention and introduce a supplementary flow of credit into the economy which is not issued for production, but which is issued instead directly for consumption. Such consumption credits will not create more costs because they don't flow through the productive system, but will flow down to cancel the excess of costs flowing from the price system, making the latter self-liquidating. In other words, balancing the price system. Hence, Douglas proposed the consumer dividend to augment the purchasing power of each citizen and the compensated price discount to retailers to lower the price level. Thus, each person would receive the benefit of increasing technological efficiency, in effect, as his rightful inheritance of a share in the expanding communal capital. It's interesting to note, just aside here, Karl Marx wanted to put the communal capital in the hands of the state, which really means in the hands of that fleet that operates the state. Major Douglas, in a sense, wanted to distribute the communal capital to each individual, to completely different policies. We have seen then that the two major objectives of orthodox economists must derive from a policy very different from social credit. You shall also see that this policy derives from a very different philosophy. Because of its insistence that money must be issued only as a debt for production, and because of its insistence that all financial costs must be recovered through prices, orthodoxy has never in fact managed to create stable prices. Indeed, it has been responsible for the continuing and progressive inflation that has characterized the world economy over its entire history under orthodox financial direction. However, even stable prices are not acceptable to social creditors. Many social creditors, I hear, say we'd like to have stable prices. Stable prices are not acceptable. Social creditors, because they demand falling prices with advancing technolo technological efficiency in order to satisfy Douglas's law of cost, the two costs of production and consumption. Moreover, the necessity to issue credits directly for consumption invalidates the orthodox desideratum of full employment. Full employment is an inseparable requirement of the policy of issuing credit only for production. As we've always already demonstrated, this policy is the core cause of the power age phenomenon of intensifying cost push inflation, which Douglas discovered as early as 1917 and 1918, and which orthodox economists only began to suspect without understanding during the 1950s. Social credit, with its policy of credits for consumption, necessarily heralds a new era, an age of leisure. It's not a question of whether or not we can afford an age of leisure. It is, rather, a question of how long we can survive as a civilization without it. The claim can be made categorically that the policy of full employment with its corollary, that is, a deficiency of purchasing power in each trade area, is directly and indirectly responsible for the following major economic and social afflictions. Because our overriding concern has turned to creating work instead of providing goods and services for consumption, as, when, and where required, in other words, in the most efficient manner possible, tremendous waste, misdirection of resources, and inefficiency have come to characterize our economy. The actual and potential benefits of modern science are sabotaged on a gigantic scale. Douglas referred to this as the tragedy of human effort, as the diminution of the purchasing power of effort. Now, because each cycle of production results in a larger carryover of unliquidated costs, we must always produce more before we are able to claim the wealth that has been produ produced in previous cycles, or in the current cycle, to be exact. The economy has become a treadmill from which there can be no escape, driven by a constant necessity, because of growing disparity between costs and income, to generate additional purchasing power for its very survival, the economy is forced into a mindless upward spiral of expansion. 
Because incomes are never sufficient, governments inject larger and larger amounts of money in order to prime the economy. Comes national debt. Both private and public debts, with their tributes of interest, pyramid. Inflation robs the individual of his savings, denying him economic security, and throwing him more and more on the mercy of the state or other sources of centralized power. Eventually, the state must become supreme as it takes over, all in the name of humanitarianism, of course, a growing number of functions that individuals could and would otherwise do for themselves. Individual freedom of choice and action decline, and with them spontaneity, creativity, initiative, and efficiency. I once worked in a plant, and an engineer came up to the area where I was, and he seemed very unhappy, and I said, what's the problem today? And he said, well, it's the process in the, in the basement. I said, well, what's wrong? And he said, well, he said, it's nobody's fault, but he said, it's the, it's the process. He said, it's unstable, and it's just not working at all. I said, well, what is wrong? He said, well, it's the human element. They just simply cannot, as human beings, operate to, the, to those fine specifications. And I said, well, for goodness sakes, couldn't you, uh, couldn't you automate it or use your technology to uh, iron the problem out? And he looked at me right straight in the eye, amazed, and said, well, yes, he said, but my God, he said, we can't do that. He said, we put all those men out of a job. That's the type of reasoning that we operate on. The, not that I'm criticizing him specifically, but it is the, the type of reasoning that we do operate on. This, uh, the situation becomes worse as savage taxes are imposed, professedly or ostensibly, to control the accelerating inflation and to correct the many injustices that spring from it through income redistribution. Now, the consumer loses control over his income, and he is more and more deprived of his economic vote, his money vote. He can no longer dictate production policy through freely chosen expenditure of his own income. Both economic and political democracy decline as production policy falls under increasingly centralized control. Now, production patterns become distorted as more and more wasteful projects are undertaken in an unrealistic and futile attempt to maintain the distribution of financial incomes through full employment. Colossal waste of natural resources has ensued. Some of those resources, as we learn today, may well be irreplaceable. The fertility of the land suffers, as those who till it are compelled to abandon the sound practices of husbandry. Caught in a desperate struggle to cope with rising costs of operation, those engaged in agriculture are forced to mine the land by extracting as much as possible from it, with minimal return in the way of proper care and cultivation. And as we know today, that is not serving to solve their problem, they are in fact being put out of business right and left. That is the farm. The economic system gradually shifts away from production for genuine consumer satisfaction toward excessive capital production as a means to close the widening chasm between costs and incomes. Eventually, the state can only resort to building great pyramids in the name of full employment and eventually for its own edification. This perversion of means into ends, this denial in practice that the true end of production is consumption, was recognized as early as the late 19th century by the English author John Ruskin. Ruskin's statement on the matter, in his Unto This Last, can hardly be improved upon. Capital, he says, is a root which does not enter into vital function till it produces something else than a root, namely fruit. That fruit will in time again produce roots, and so all living capital issues in reproduction of capital. But capital, which produces nothing but capital, is only root-producing root. Bald issuing in bulk, never in pure. Seed issuing in seed, never in grave. The political economy of Europe, Ruskin said, has hitherto devoted itself wholly to the multiplication or the aggregation of bulbs. It never saw nor conceived such a thing as a tulip. End of quote. Stress is laid more and more on promoting exports as we attempt to capture external, so-called external purchasing power, and to ex export our so-called unemployment problem to other nations by obtaining a so-called favorable balance of trade, that is, an excess of exports over imports. Thus we are led into the absurd position of coveting money above real wealth. 
any fact of thinking that if we could only export everything we produced without receiving anything in return, we would have re reached the millennium. This inability to differentiate between substance and symbol has also led to such absurdities as state subsidies to restrict agricultural production and to the deliberate destruction of produce and foodstuffs, as in the recent burning of food crops in Europe, I believe it was last year or the year before, to maintain their economic value. Such are the perversions wrought by a system of economics which takes as its point of departure the assumption that value derives from scarcity. Surely, something that isn't there cannot be of value to human beings as consumers. Truly has it been said that the love of money is the root of all evil. Competition increases to anti-social lengths among individuals and nations as the desperate scramble for a share in the increasingly inadequate purchasing power pool becomes more intense. The discovery is soon made that military expenditure serves to prime the economy along its destructive course. The existence of weaponry and the friction generated by the international struggle for markets ensure that war, the great wastemaker, is almost continuous. The orthodox exhortation to export or die might well be changed to export and die. We have come to believe that it is more moral to drop bombs on other people than to peaceably, peace, peacefully share our surplus wealth through the distribution of a national dividend. We have learned to live on the sweat, suppression, and anguish of people bound to useless toil. We have learned to live on the blood of our own children who are sent off to foreign battlefields to murder and to be murdered. Perhaps now we can begin to appreciate the slogan of the British Social Credit Party under the leadership of the late John Hargrave, who asserted, He who shouts for work shouts for war. Lacking sufficient purchasing power to command the productive system, the individual becomes a pawn in a vast economic machine. Mammon reigns supreme, materialistic preoccupations the chief concern of human life. Deprived of the power to act freely and independently, the individual is subject to policies imposed by the will of those who possess monopolistic and centralized control over the activities of men. Forced to engage in futile, useless, and even destructive activities, and subject to vicious competition and dishonest advertising, men become dull and cynical. Their sense of purpose and responsibility become impaired. In a truly criminal manner, the moral and spiritual quality of life, not to mention its level of, of cultural activity, is forced to decline down the scale of existence. The efflorescence of spiritual, creative, and cultural activities is inhibited. Men sense, consciously or subconsciously, a certain futility and sterility in many of their activities. Consequent to this usually vague and ill-defined awareness of the perversion of their own lives and capacities, their image or concept of self, and therefore their self-respect and psychological integrity become severely damaged. Subject to the pressures of an artificially and overly activated economic and social life, they develop many unnatural tensions. Neuroses and psychosomatic illnesses multiply, and we wonder why our psychiatric institutions and hospitals are filled to capacity. The constant battle to recover mushrooming industrial costs by industry and the struggle of workers and consumers to meet the prices of goods and services stimulate labor capital and other hostility. Thus, the class wars fan and revolutionary forces are unleashed upon society. The historical rebellion of youth against adult authority no longer it represents merely a healthy desire to strike out for an independent life. It now represents a desire to destroy what their impulses and much subtle revolutionary education have prompted them to identify as a corrupt order. Unfortunately, many of these youth fail to isolate the core causes of economic and social injustice and fall into patterns of behavior which can only hasten the disintegration of society without in any way offering constructive solutions. <clears throat> Others, more passive, attempt to escape by an atavistic withdrawal from society. The chief beneficiaries of this unhappy state of affairs, into which mankind has fallen, are the domestic and foreign controllers of money and credit, and the revolutionary forces with whom they have had strange historical connections. Both are champions of monopoly, who covet centralized control over the affairs and activities of men, and who profit from human suffering and enslavement. They are the chief advocates of the policy of full employment, 
upon which the centralization of power is dependent. We have seen that the policy of full employment is directly and indirectly the cause of a general perversion of human activities and purpose, of inefficiency, waste, want, and war. Meanwhile, both exploiters and exploited cry in unison for more employment. Those who join in the lunatic plan for full employment must bear a heavy burden of responsibility for the results of the policy they so confidently espouse, and for the fate of the world that they are wrecking. A misguided world may believe that its salvation lies in the achievement of the work state, so beloved of dictators throughout history. Social creditors, however, have no hesitation in asserting, work was and remains a curse. Full employment is sacrifice of mankind to the false, false god, Moloch. One of the most forceful expressions of the social credit position in this regard was given by the late Alfred R. R. Raj, the brilliant English economist, editor of the New Age and the New English Weekly, which journals contributed so much to the intellectual quality of the early social credit movement between 1917 and 1934. In R. Raj's words, quote, Either what appears to be free and unearned provision for consumption as such must be deliberately made by society, simultaneously and progressively with provision for production, or production itself will be brought to a standstill, either by wholesale sabotage or by revolution. The pill of money for nothing may be better for old men of all ages to swallow, but the alternatives before society are to swallow it or perish. We assert with complete confidence that the acceptance and legislation of the principle of the national dividend is absolutely essential to the mere maintenance and not only to the welfare of modern civilization. It is a matter for modern nations of national dividends or debt. comes from a book called A.R. Raj, Political and Economic Writings, collected in 1936. Why has the present tragic situation come to pass? Why has the social credit remedy not been applied? In a remarkable address delivered to the Leisure Society entitled The Fear of Leisure, Orange listed a number of resistances to Douglas social credit. These included fear of scarcity, the moral associations with work, hatred of the principle of something for nothing. There's really never something for nothing in the ultimate sense. Or is there? Maybe there is. Maybe almost everything we have is for nothing in sense. Class hatred on the one side and class revenge on the other. The deep-rooted conviction that man is not meant to be happy, the belief and the belief that any prospect of happiness is too good to be true and that human nature would soon spoil any conditions of happiness that might be achieved, included also was the will to power over the lives of others, the fear of leisure itself, and the fear of any change whatever. This comes from the fear of leisure in a book called The Social Credit Pamphleteer by Various Hands, published, I don't have the publication date. As we have seen, the problem is also partly due to an intellectual unpreparedness for the advent of the power age, the age of automation, and more recently of cybernation. Man has yet, not yet stopped to realize the actual nature of modern production. Today, human labor has become little more than a mere catalyst in the productive process. The number of human energy units expended relative to the expenditure of other forms of energy, including, of course, the forces of nature, have become very small. In the physical sense, Production today is largely unearned, being a result not of currently expended human effort, but rather of a vast cultural and scientific heritage reaching back to the beginning of civilization, and of an endless chain of unearned increments of association which could not be realized by individuals acting alone. This is all in addition again, to the enormous sources of energy derived gratis from nature itself. What brings the water into the air and carries it over the mountain and dumps it on the crops? But our anachronistic and disastrous failure to break the traditional link between work and income has a primarily psychological cause. And until man overcomes this obstacle, there would seem to be little hope for the acceptance of social credit and for a better civilization, the better civilization that social credit would bring. This obstacle lies essentially in our dimly perceived fear of ourselves, in our own lack of self-confidence and inner integrity, which we dare not wholly admit to ourselves, but prefer to project on other men. It manifests itself in a destructive puritanism that attempts to restrict expansion of the human personality 
that teaches that man is inherently perverse and can be trusted with neither freedom of choice nor assured material security. This attitude is no doubt exemplified in the statement of a great financier who is reported once to have said, social credit would save the world or save civilization, but civilization is not worth saving. Norman Webb makes a penetrating inquiry into this matter in his essay, Social Credit and the Christian Ethics. He writes, quote, The identity of Christ's teaching and what we call economic democracy is, I believe, fundamental. The two are in contact at every point, and the primary obstacle to the realization of both of them is literally the very devil, and its name is Puritanism. Puritanism, as I understand it, erroneously connected in many minds with purity, has nothing in common with Christ's teaching. When Christ said to the young man who asked him for a decision between his brother and himself, man, who made me judge or divider over you? He was demonstrating in the highest degree the opposite impulse to that which I call, or I designate, Puritanism. Judge not that she be not judged. There is a law of life, and I think that Christ has plainly demonstrated for us that the primary fact of existence is that we are here and conscious for the purpose of learning to understand the law. The puritanical misconception is that we are here, individually, for the Puritan, to administer the law. Puritanism, as I said, is of the devil, clothing the very deepest and darkest passion of the human mind, the impulse to dominate over one's fellow mortals, in a moral disguise. It is the Puritan who has always been ready to shed blood in the past, for there is no more terrible phenomenon than the man who identifies God with his own abysmal will to power. And it will be the Puritan who will be ready to shed it in the future. Christ's realistic mission was to free man, and the opposition he met is precisely the opposition presented to social credit. The truth is that the Puritan element in man does not wish to be free. Because it, it, its desire is to dominate over its fellows, it opposes the idea of their enfranchisement, which is its own. The devil fears freedom above everything, and his own most of all. It is quite natural that when applied science comes along offering material freedom and abundance, the Puritan, the devil's advocate, that lurks in each one of us, should be arrayed against it. Or that when we espouse a movement ca uh, calling for a realistic acceptance of the fact of economic freedom, we are met with deadly resistance from the vested interests of the Prince of Darkness. The foundation of the Christian teaching is love, or trust, in the sense of absence of fear. Perfect love casteth out fear. That form of love social credit represents. Social credit is a firmer belief in the fundamental decency, goodness, if you like, of human nature in the face of a world cowering abjectly before its own degraded picture of itself. Coercive legislation and armaments and leagues are all a direct outcome of fear and hatred, distrust of human nature. Into that dark abyss our present civilization seems to be descending and constructively opposed to that worldwide tendency, there are literally only two forces, the teaching of Christ and the philosophy of social credit, published in the Douglas Social Credit Journal of Fig Tree in 1937. Webb goes on to say that the actual social breakup cannot be long delayed. He asks whether it might yet be possible that Christianity and social credit might unite as a force round which the remnant of this present marvelous and tragic civilization might reform. In his book, Neither Do They Spear, Dr. Brian Monahan, chairman of the Douglas Social Credit Secretariat, cautions us that full employment is a fundamental policy, not an economic theory. Remember, full employment is a policy, not a theory, which denies men the independent incomes that should and could be the basis of freedom of choice. In concluding his essay, Dr. Monahan quotes Robert Payne from his Fathers of the Western Church. 1952. Quote, it does seem that our materialist hell, with its brutish policy of work for employment's sake and its degradation of man into a mere functionary, is the triumph of Antichrist. But beyond it lies the promise of a renewed spirituality, an age of the Holy Ghost, an age of devotion, when they toil not. Throughout history, perceptive men have recognized the regenerative and creative potentialities of leisure. Socrates said it was that it was that which men should most value. Even Thomas Hobbes, who I certainly don't agree with in many things, was able to discern that leisure is the mother of all culture. 
C. H. Douglas and A. R. Orage have shown that the survival of civilization depends upon the introduction of the leisure state. Properly viewed, unemployment is a blessing. Work was the curse put on Adam. God is striving to lift the curse, but it can only be lifted when men reject the false doctrine that all wealth and rights arise from man, a doctrine perpet perpetrated and perpetuated by those materialists who understand that they must destroy the belief in a beneficent God preparatory to the subjection of mankind to a temporal world power. The curse can only be swept away when men become psychologically prepared to receive the blessings of abundance, when they learn to share and to understand the meaning and mechanism of share. If man is to reach out toward his rightful destiny in a new age, he must regard his fellow man no longer as an actual or potential blight on the moral landscape, but rather as a flower with its right to an inheritance in the garden. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? The claim has often been made that Clifford Hugh Douglas was fifty years ahead of his time. It has also been said that nothing can stop the power of an idea whose time has come. We of the social credit movement believe that the era of the national dividend is dawning. And ladies and gentlemen, we appeal to you to help us make it a reality. Thank you.